Okay, good, good evening. And uh, well, first of all, uh, today we will try to continue uh, the work on the or, and close on the web technology that we need to learn uh, with JavaScript and jQuery and Ajax. And uh, but before uh, doing that, uh, I just only want to show you uh, the, the website that we are preparing for collecting all of your projects. Okay. So right now, I, uh, we have prepared this MEI 2017 page.github.io with the list of all the 16 projects uh, that are currently alive, as, as at least uh, as far as we know. Okay, and uh, we linked uh, for to every say project uh, the, your website that you are developing, so that we have the general picture of all the websites uh, you can also have a look and, at the other groups and so on and uh, we will uh, later update this page when the at the end of the month more or less when the website will be more complete uh, we will replace this general picture with a snapshot of your website so with the actual graphics uh, of your website because mo most of them are currently only have a very preliminary graphics so it was not worth uh, showing it here um, only have a look that in some cases we couldn't find a, a website uh, where you see coming soon the link doesn't go anywhere uh, at least it goes to the address where the website should be but actually there is no website there so if you are in this condition please hurry up and try to, to prepare the website with the, the deliver one and deliver all two contents uh, before the end of the week uh, it may happen in some cases that some of you have changed the name of the repository right? by putting a dash putting a dot or changing a bit the name so we have the old address uh, and maybe you already have the website but it's, uh, this page doesn't point uh, to the same address that uh, we had at the beginning in this case just tell us so that we can update uh, our records and generate this page correctly so this page is actually the, the, the showcase of, of your project from the, from, from the web point of view. Mm -hmm. And will be used uh, at the end of the month uh, in the, uh, let's say, general uh, presentation of the project with the, the companies. So I will share this page with them, with the companies before, so that they can have a look at your project before coming and listening to your presentation. Okay, so just for a reminder for checking the links uh, and having a look at yours at your website and also others and later on I will ask you I will also ask you for a sentence to write here right right now we just copied the first sentence that you had on the website uh, but if you have a, a, a nice uh, catch line or a two or three lines description we will paste it here so that uh, before entering to the website uh, people could have uh, an idea about uh, uh, what the project about hmm? but for now it's not necessary we are building this in parallel with the website okay so you may remember that uh, uh, last week uh, we started to work uh, in JavaScript uh, and we started to think uh, to reason about uh, the programming model of JavaScript inside web pages okay so this picture is more or less uh, the pattern in which all the, or most of the, of the JavaScript programming happens. The web page is there, and it waits uh, for some user action. Uh, users do things on web pages. They move the mouse, they click, uh, they enter data, they um, select uh, some checkboxes, and so on or push buttons or select a menu items or link or whatever so uh, every user action every action that you do on a web page is actually done in the context of a specific html element uh, so for example when i i'm clicking here i'm clicking instead of a specific what is this and uh,
an H2 element, this specific element. So I'm clicking, the user action is always associated with a specific part of the page. I'm not clicking on the page. I'm clicking on a specific element inside the page. So uh, the actions of the user on some elements of the page generate events. So the HTML, HTML element in the page, when the user does something, clicking, typing, moving the mouse, or whatever, uh, the element generates an event. Say, okay, this happened to me. The user clicked on me, the user typed on me, and so on. This always, this chain always happens. HTML elements are always aware of what the user is doing, and if the user is doing something upon them, they generate events. Most of these events uh, are lost. So if I'm clicking, uh, I don't know, uh, here, or here, or here, nothing happens. The events associated with the click and with the mouse movement also, and with me entering or exiting from a rectangular area for, from a div element, all these uh, events are generated, but they are lost. Because uh, by default, the browser doesn't need to do anything special mm, to handle these events. The browser only needs to, to handle, basically, the click events on a link or the typing and submitting events on a form. That is where the browser needs to do something. But in all the other cases, the browser that just doesn't care about whether the user is moving or clicking or typing in some part of the page. What we can do as uh, JavaScript programmers, as front-end programmers, is to redefine the handling of some of these events. So we are interested in knowing when the user is clicking on an element, is entering a form, is typing a word, or something like that. So an event that is normally generated and lost and wasted is now being captured and handled by our code. So we define some handlers for such events. And an event handler is nothing more than a JavaScript function that gets called automatically by the browser every time a given event happens on a given HTML element. Okay? So it's very easy to associate a given function handler to an, a given HTML element through some HTML attributes. Uh, for example, if I want to associate an event handler to the click event on the a title, the H2 title, as before, I just need to add the, an onClick attribute to the H2 element. And onClick, the value of this attribute will be the JavaScript code to execute. Of course, it's always inconvenient to put JavaScript code inside an HTML tag, so in 99% of the cases, uh, that JavaScript code would be, would be a, a call to a function a function will be called. Hmm? Uh, and this function will be defined elsewhere in an external JavaScript file. Mm -hmm. Just for, con for, non for avoiding to write a lot of code instead, uh, inside you know, uh, uh, the, an attribute value of an HTML element that would be a very uh, inconvenient place to, to write code. Okay, so that's, uh, that's automatic. Uh, for making this happen, we just need to specify which event handler needs to be associated to which element. Now, what does the, the event handler do, usually? The event handler gets called, is called asynchronously. Asynchronous means that uh, we have no control in the code over when this function is called, whether a function is called before or after another function. Because it's the user actions that determine which functions are called in which order with what with which delay among each other. So we have no control about when this function is called. We know that it's, it will be called when the user causes 
that condition, generate this event. And uh, this function usually needs to understand what's happening on the page. So usually, first of all, the JavaScript function would need to, to read some information about the page. Okay, where is the user? Where did it click? What did it write in the text area? And so on. So it needs to find some elements in the page that may be the same elements uh, where the user clicked, so the, the same element that generate the event, or maybe something different, some different element. Imagine if you are trying, if you are clicking the submit button of a form, okay? Before submitting, you need to validate the data to ensure that all the mandatory fields are provided with a value. So when the user clicks, so the click event, or the better, the submit event of the button is fired, the event tender actually doesn't care about the submit button because there's no information in the button. The event tender cares about the text or the content or the values that are written in many other fields. So the JavaScript code that runs inside the context of the page needs first to find all these fields, find the value of these fields, and then decide whether the form is valid and so it can be submitted, or the form is incomplete, and so we should prevent the submission and maybe write some messages, some error messages, or highlight some elements to show the user that some data is missing. Again, high, uh, writing some text or highlighting some elements uh, means uh, modifying some existing objects in the page or creating new, new objects in the page. But before modifying, before highlighting an element, before showing another message, we must first find the place where the, the message occurs. So one key capability of a JavaScript uh, event tender would be to find the objects, DOM objects, objects representing HTML elements. Find the input, find the title, find the button, and so on. Find the text span where the error message could be written, and so on. And then, so we, will, we need to learn how a JavaScript function can find elements, how can it read the, the properties of such elements that we, did, we just found, and or it can modify these properties. So in this way, modifying the properties of some objects in the DOM, in the page, changes the page, changes the appearance of the page, changes the contents of the page. So that gives the, the dynamic behavior. And uh, since these modifications also de depend on the values of some other properties, so on the previous action of the user, actually this modification, this dynamic behavior is customized to the specific user action. It's not something that is just an, a predefined animation that goes on with some uh, own behavior. This is something that, is, that depends on what the user is doing. So you, you just need these three ingredients. Finding elements, reading values, changing values. And this gives you the programming capabilities of creating uh, dynamic pages. Of course, every element needs to be managed in a specific way, depending on what the user uh, wants to do. Um, for example, I played a bit uh, with the exercise that we were doing last time. You remember last time we finished very late, uh, so we had a bug in our code that prevented it from working. Uh, it turned out uh, after debugging that the, the problem was that uh, this, this code is slightly modified, it's not uh, exactly the one from last time, but uh, I had, what is that? You remember I was trying to uh, get the focus to uh, intercept when the user entered into the text area. I was uh, handling the on focus uh, event uh, of a given text area. 
and it didn't work. Uh, my fault, uh, of course, it's always the programmer's fault, uh, and it didn't work because of the name of the function that I chose. I chose a, a function that was called focus. Hmm? Last time, if you see the last uh, three minutes, uh, uh, the function that was called focus, uh, and it turns out that the focus is already a function predefined by one of the libraries that is included in Bootstrap. So there was a conflict in the name of the function, that's why it didn't get called. Hmm? It didn't work. Because I was referring, it was calling a different uh, function from the one that I defined. So I just changed the name my focus here, and in JavaScript also I called the function my focus, and now it's working. So I want to show you a couple of very simple functionality that I built on top of this, just to illustrate hmm, the workflow of these JavaScript event handlers, and then we can move on to make things uh, easier using a more powerful library. Hmm? Uh, so let's run it so that I can show you what happened. Okay, so I changed a bit, uh, but very, <laughs> a very uh, little the, the graphics of the, this application. So this is actually the same application as last week. The only difference is that instead of a, or it's always a list item, um, and, and an order list here, but I use the bootstrap just to make it look like, like uh, what is that, a list group. So there is a bootstrap uh, class that is called list group, uh, and list group item that transform uh, balleted lists uh, into this sort of uh, lightweight table. And then instead of the delete button, uh, the, we had a link with the delete word in it, if you remember. I replaced that uh, word with a glyph, with a glyph, I don't know the exact pronunciation, and uh, uh, always uh, again generated by Bootstrap. So if you want to have these icons that are very useful in the in uh, graphical applications, an easy way We are here in get bootstrap, we go into components, and the first group of components are these glyphs. And uh, you have plenty of them to choose from. And each of them, you don't need to include any, they are not images, no, there's a, a very simple way of including them, which is an empty span, a span object with nothing in between, so it's, just, it's empty with the class glyph icon, all of them should have the class glyph icon, and then the specific class glyph icon dash the name of the, uh, of the glyph. So glyph icon education, glyph icon uh, option vertical, glyph icon cloud download, and whatever. So uh, it's easy, very easy to include them in, in your uh, websites, uh, and it, it makes it look nicer. Okay, what did I do? Sorry. What did I do with my event handler? Uh, I remember you remember that I defined an event handler for the focus event on this input element. Let's revise it from the code. We have an input element here. Class form control because Bootstrap then makes it look nicer. And then we have the on focus calling the my focus uh, um, function. And just to play a bit, uh, I decided that the user should not be able to press the enter button until it tries to enter something in the in this field. So the enter button you see that is being barred, is disabled now. Uh, how did I do this? It's very easy. It's already an HTML property where the submit button, which is this line of code, is disabled. Uh, you can put a disabled attribute with any value. So 
usually by default we, we, we write disabled again as a property value into the HTML element. And this instructs the browser to render the button, but to make it impossible to operate, disabled. So when the user clicks uh, on the text area, we want to re-enable the button. Very simple thing to do. So in the event handler, the event handler is called when the user focuses, enters with a cursor, with a blinking cursor inside the text area. At that point, uh, we should remove this disabled attribute from the button element. So when an event is generated on this element, on the input element, then a modification, then we need to force a modification to one attribute of another element in the page. It's often the case. You get some information here and you need to modify something there. See? And uh, if I click here, you see that the enter button immediately becomes operational. Okay, we can do be something better. You can, we can make it become operational only if I write something. Okay, but this is, the, this is just the first step. Okay, when I, and when I click here, this button becomes operational. So what, what is the event handler doing here? It's removing the disabled attribute from that button. How does it do it? Let's look at the code. It's just one line here. First of all, I need to modify some attribute of some element, okay, element in the page. So this code is just one line, but it's split conceptually in two. The left, the left hand part the left-hand part of this line is uh, finding the element, which is the element or which are the elements that we need to modify or we need to query. In this case, we don't need to get any property. But And uh, in this case, uh, we can use the function with the simplest query function that we have. Uh, so, uh, sorry, first of all, document. Document is the name of the DOM object. You remember the DOM was in general the, the tree of all the objects. In JavaScript, the, uh, the reference to the whole document is in the variable that is called, in predefined variable called document. So everything will start with document. And document, which is the tree of the DOM, sorry, is the root of the DOM tree, has a function called get element by id. What does it do? It searches all the tree beneath the root, so all the page, seeking for or searching for an element whose uh, id is a submit button. So I marked the submit button, so as an element that I want to be able to find, so I provide it with an id in the code, ID is submit button. So that it gets, it becomes easier to find. So uh, we are doing the same thing as we did with CSS. We are writing basic HTML, but then we add uh, IDs and classes to be able to find or customize or to modify elements uh, in an easier way. So if I have an ID, ID is a unique identifier, and so I can find uniquely an element in the page. So the result of this document.getElementById is like when you look an object into a dictionary. You give it the key, and it re uh, returns you the element, the object. And we can modify the values, the properties of this object. Now we have a reference of the JavaScript to the JavaScript objects object that, that represents that little tiny button. And we can use some methods like remove attributes, 
add attributes and so on, or some properties of that object to modify it in some way. Hmm? Uh, visually, you can also see it in the, I don't know, in the developer tools. where you should be able to see form input button and these are only the styles oh, I don't see the properties here and DOM Explorer and the DOM elements are not shown here. Oh, sorry, let me open this with Chrome where I'm more familiar with. This is the same page, okay? But uh, the with Chrome, I know where to find information. So I want to inspect this button. Okay, we have all the styles, all the CSS for the button. And, uh, but we also have, uh, proper, okay, it's a tab properties that was missing from what's the Internet, Internet Explorer. Uh, and we see that uh, this button has a lot of properties. Every element in HTML has a long batch of properties. Some are derived from CSS, some are the event sender, you see the whole block on the, of, the, of own properties. Most of them are not defined, null, and, uh, uh, and so on. And we have this property disabled, you see that we find it here which is set true. Hmm? So if you look at the DOM documentation, you will find all the list of all these properties. And so we can we know what we want to change. Hmm? In this case, we want to change uh, or to remove an attribute or setting it to false or removing it is equivalent in this case from that button. So this is what happens easily. We click here and the button changes. And if you have a look at the new properties, you see that disabled now is false instead of true. Okay, so we have dynamically changed a value of an attribute of an object hidden inside the, the DOM. And the, the visual effect, the practical effect is that this button now becomes operational. Just because we entered into this uh, text field. If I reload the page, everything starts over from the beginning because a new page is loaded, a new JavaScript is loaded, uh, everything is new. I can enter into that uh, text area also with a keyboard, for example, and the result is the same. So I, I navigated not with the mouse, but instead with a tab key. It's another way, using the keyboard, the tab, the, the arrows, to navigate uh, through the page and to give focus to elements. So that's why I chose uh, to use the on-focus event instead of the on-click event, because I want to be able uh, also to activate the handler when I enter, or in a focus, when I give the, 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 the blinking uh, cursor into that element in any way, with the mouse, with the keyboard, with a touch, the finger, if I had a touch screen here, and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's uh, the easy way. Of course, uh, we have to learn, we would have to learn, the query methods for finding elements uh, in the document and uh, the method for modifying this object. I will not spend uh, too much detail, I will not give it too much detail about this because we will bypass this by using a simplified library. Okay, so we don't need to learn the plain JavaScript code. Right now we are just writing the, in the low-level JavaScript code 
that works in every browser without any specific additional library. What do I do uh, also to show you something? I added this uh, button here. I added a, a second icon. So this uh, uh, cross is just a, the old delete function. So if I click it here, it deletes the, the line. But I, it, there, there's nothing dynamic. There's nothing about JavaScript on it. No? It's just the old. Uh, it was a word. Uh, now it's an icon. But this is new. Uh, what I did is to provide that functionality to move uh, a description of a task into this line. You see, when I click here, the description of the task is copied there. So if I want, uh, I can modify it and enter a new copy of it. So instead of doing cut and paste by hand, uh, I have this little functionality. Copy the text uh, below, which is the first step for providing an editing functionality. Right now I can copy, edit, and insert a new one. Better thing to do would be to copy, edit, and replace the older one. It would, that would be more difficult, but we are not doing that right now. We are just interested in copying. How can I can do that? So right now we have three players. We have uh, the button. The icon that reacts uh, to the click event. We have uh, the text uh, that needs to be copied. And what is the text? It's the content of the list item. And third, we have the input element that is the destination of the copy. So we have three unrelated elements that need to be connected by our work with, uh, by our event tender. The first one, the button is just for um, um, registering the event tender, for triggering the event. I want to do something, not when the user clicks on the, on the name, but when the user clicks uh, on the link, on the, on the icon. So we register the event tender on the icon. Let's look at the code. The icon, the code for the icon is here. It's here from line 12. Uh, no, sorry, line 13. 13 is a glyph, glyph icon download alternative shape, and it doesn't have anything else. So this is the icon from here to there. And the icon is wrapped uh, into a link, into an A. You see that we have an A, a link. Why do I do that? Because I want the cursor to turn into a hand when I'm hovering over the, the element. Okay, so only if it's defined as a link, uh, then the cursor will uh, switch to a little hand uh, like this, like that so on and here so I want this icon to look like a link to look so like something that can be clicked on but it's not a normal link it doesn't lead to any other web page I don't need I don't need and, and I want to change the web page so one trick is to give a fake uh, uh, address which is just a hash hash sign hash is a uh, a way of locating a position inside a page. So I can click not to the top of a page, but to the middle of a page if I have an anchor, a named anchor, for pointing to uh, the article number 27 of a blog, for example, in the same page. Right now, I'm not specifying any page name, so that would be an internal link, a link that is internal to the same page. So it doesn't change the page, actually. A click that does nothing. Usually this click will do nothing. But then I'm redefining the action of this click. This click will be a useless click because it doesn't bring me anywhere. But now I'm redefining the action that will be carried on when this element is clicked with, with my own event handler. 
and uh, I call it copy down, copy the text down, copy below, duplicate the text, uh, name like that you like. And uh, the difference is that uh, there are many of these icons, right? And the function that gets called is always the same. If you look at the source code here, because we, have, we, we were writing the template, but this line is inside a for loop. So this uh, on click, copy down, on click, copy down, on click, copy down is repeated many times. So the function that gets called is always the same, right? But how can the function know whether it was called when the user clicked on the first or the second or the third or the fourth item? Because the function then needs to do different things. It needs to copy buy a new mouse or it needs to copy find the present as a text. So the actual behavior of the function should be different depending on which icon they click. So I must give to this function some information for allowing the function to discriminate, to understand uh, which elements, uh, where it was clicked uh, and uh, which is the element uh, related to that. There are several ways of doing that. Hmm? One way could be to have a, a counter here in the loop, in this four, I could have a variable starting from one, two, three, four, five, and counting that, and calling the copy function with this counter. Copy function counter, so copy function will be called uh, with the parameter one here, copy function one, and here copy function two, copy function three, and so on. So the function would have information to understand which row of the list item it should consider it's a way, one, one way of doing that. I chose a different way, probably simpler. I pass to this function this, which is this is the reference to the currently to the current uh, uh, object context. This is in general, in all object oriented programming means the objects in which you are calling the method. So where are we calling the method? On this element, here, on the A element. So in this context, this, the this variable refers to this A element. Sorry, not this, what I'm doing, oh, okay, I'm not in Chrome. <laughs> So actually, in the in the DOM, what are you doing? Okay, ten plus eight here. When we call the method, this is pointing to this line, but not the it's not the string a href equal. It's the object. Okay. So uh, what should the function do? I have I have the reference to this object, I need this one. I need a text. So I should start from this object, go to the parent. So the, this A is contained into this li, list item. I navigate the tree. Starting from a node, the A node is inside li. So starting from the anchor, I navigate up to my parent, to my container node list item, and then down to the text inside the list item. Okay. I'm uh, driving blind here. Imagine having to drive, not a car because it's dangerous, a bike, but blinded. Okay, or walking even blind. You know that you are inside a, a link, and you know that this link is uh, inside a list item. So you move blindly one step to your left, 
because I know that this will be the list item. Cross your fingers. This should be the list item. And so the list item doesn't have only where it was uh, the A element. It also has some text content. So I move one step up and one step down in a different direction. And if, every, in, if, if everything is okay, I would end up uh, onto the text uh, instead of uh, crashing down into the script. So this is one way of finding elements, navigating through the DOM of the page. Uh, copy down is a function that I get called. Element is this, is the anchor, is the A element. Element dot parent node. I move into the parent node. Let's have again a look at the properties of this icon. So I'm selecting this one, the A, and uh, it has many properties. One of these properties is the parent, P, 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 parent node. The parent node of this A is the LI. Parent node is list item. So I move into the parent node. The parent node, I'm opening this here, has a lot of other properties. For example, the inner text property contains all the text that is included in all the children of the node. It's one of the many properties. Of course, for programming JavaScript, we, you should become familiar with the most important property here. So I'm going from the link to the list item, getting all the t text, and all this text will contain a lot of spaces before and after, because it's all the spacing uh, that we have in the source code. All these spaces here, spaces here, spaces here, and so on. We need to, we want to delete those, and so we can Trim the content. Trimming a string means re uh, removing the trailing and leading spaces. Trimming away all the white space. So what remains is only the text content, the real text content of that list item. So again, finding an element by navigating blindly Get in the context of an element, the content, some property, in this case the text property, doing some operation on that, and then we need to modify the value of another element with the, the text that we just uh, extracted from, a, from the first one. So again, find the element, modify the property. In this case, the, the element is uh, this text area. We already have uh, an ID. We defined an ID for this text area, which, which makes it easier to find because it's unique. It's, there's only one, so I can have a unique ID. Find the element by its ID and changing the value property to the text that was just extracted from the list item. So this couple of lines of code is executed every time you click on any of these icons, any of these glyph, glyph icons. We could not play, we couldn't have uh, used, uh, for example, get element by ID here instead of the navigating blindly to the parent node because uh, then we should be able to generate many different IDs, not always what the same. And so the, the function would, uh, would need to know which is the ID. So this uh, is probably the, the, the easiest way of doing that. 
uh, I was saying blindly because, well, actually just imagine what happens if we want to, I don't know, draw a border inside this icon. So this icon, the parent of this icon would no longer be the list item, but it would be probably a span that will draw the border. So to find the text, uh, I would in this case need to go to the parent of the parent, twice up, of course. And uh, if I want to reorganize this as a table instead of a list item, so to find this, so that the text is in the left column of, of the table and the icons would be on the right column or the second column of the table, then going from the button to the text means going from the icon up to the table data, up to the table row element, and down to the first table row uh, data that will contain the text. So the kind of navigation that we do on the DOM is highly, extremely highly dependent on the details of the page. So every modification to the template in HTML, where's the chart? Every modification to the template here, because you want to modify the graphic, I want to add a new button or whatever, risks of invalidating this navigation code. Okay? We should probably find better solutions. Okay? We can find better solutions. We can make it a bit more intelligent instead of being blind. Say, okay, go up until you find the list item. So a little loop so that if I go, I need to go up one parent or two or three, it doesn't matter. It will find one. Hmm? Or other tricks like that. But it will make the code more complex. So to avoid uh, making all this uh, or becoming crazy with this, uh, we usually, or people usually use uh, more advanced libraries, and in particular, in the case of JavaScript, uh, one library which is really famous, because actually is used everywhere, is called uh, jQuery. Probably you already heard it. And for, a lot, for many people, Saying jQuery or saying JavaScript uh, are synonyms. They, they think they are the same or nearly the same. So what, the, what does JavaScript do? Sorry, what does jQuery do? Javas jQuery is a JavaScript library. You need to include it in your page. Uh, by the way, the Flash Bootstrap extension already includes JavaScript, jQuery, so we don't need to do anything more. It's already there, to be honest. And it will make much easier the three main tasks that we need to do in JavaScript. Which are the three main tasks? Finding elements, getting properties, reading properties, and writing or changing properties or changing elements. And it, it does, does it in a very, well, simple but, uh, way, but strange at the beginning. So we need uh, at least... Uh, don't, don't be afraid if you have a five minutes of this conversation and then it will, uh, will fit in place. Uh, so actually, the, the operation is finding elements, which is probably one of the com most complex things of finding the right element and doing something with it. Reading, or querying it, reading some information, some data, or, um, or writing that. Uh, the jQuery library is quite a long piece of JavaScript that only defines one function. This function is called jQuery, strange enough. But since you will be using this function hundreds of time, at times in a row on the same page, there's an abbreviation for this function name, which is also called dollar. So dollar, the dollar sign is a legal identifier in JavaScript. It can call a variable dollar, like underscore. 
and uh, these people choose to use the variable like it's, it's like calling it uh, x instead of x it would be dollar it's just a variable name it's strangely looking because it looks uh, a syntax element but actually it's a name of a function okay so we will use this name dollar to uh, call this uh, javascript function so this jquery function this function uh, behaves in different ways uh, depending on the parameters the simplest uh, behavior is uh, given to jQuery or better let's get used to this format so this and this are the same but let's get used to this format I'm giving a string as a parameter and this string uh, is looks like and actually it is a CSS selector we already know this syntax we use that in CSS. So since people or we already learned the CSS selector syntax, which is a one way, if you, you, th you, uh, if you think about it, it's one way of uh, selecting one or more elements inside a page with a very simple syntax. So hash nav is a CSS selector for identifying the only element in the page with ID equal to nav. So this syntax, jQuery, hash nav, is uh, equivalent to document dot get element by ID nav. I'm searching, jQuery is searching for the elements, the elements plural that match that CSS expression. In this case, the CSS expression is an ID expression, so only one element will match. At most, one element will match. So it's a easy way of finding an element. Hmm? Okay, it's less typing than what we had here, but it's semantically the same. Finding that element. But uh, we can do more. We can use any CSS syntax. Actually, in jQuery, we have a more extended format, the more extended version of the CSS syntax, so we can have more selectors. So in this case, we are selecting all the H2 instead of the div with ID info. So the, all the second level headings inside the, div the divider element called the info. Remember when we were looking at this website, and saying uh, these are all h2 inside the div I don't know whether this div is called the intro or something else but that would be a way of selecting all of them so in this case this uh, jQuery selector it's, non, it's no longer a CSS selector it's a jQuery selector will return a list of DOM elements that match that syntax and the good part is that any operation that we do on this list, I don't know, making it, uh, changing its color, making it um, enabled or disabled, will, will be any operation that we do will be applied to all of them. So we select a group of elements in a batch, and we operate on all of them with, one, with just one operation. And all the looping and applying the operation to each and every element is done automatically by jQuery. So we are operating at a, mu at a much at a much higher level. Hmm? We are uh, selecting all the links inside the list item with class current instead of any element with ID nav. And so we are selecting all the A elements and then we can do something. So the finding part, the finding elements part becomes as easy as CSS. We find one or more elements that match our criteria. Okay, we can do more. Which we have all the advanced syntax, uh, like matching an element with a, with a value of an attribute. It could be useful for forms where we match input with the value of the name, uh, with, the, with the name attribute of the input element that we want to match. But you know, it seems that if we want, we can, we can dive, dive into that. Or we can do something differently in the first paragraph or in the last paragraph of the text for 
dealing with them differently and so on. And so there's a sort of a micro syntax inside, inside these jQuery selectors. But 90% of all, all the concepts just come from CSS. And <coughs> what happens is that when you run a jQuery, that's uh, the reason behind the, the name of the library. jQuery means for JavaScript query. Actually, you are running a query on the, over the DOM, and it will give you a list of the results that match those selectors. And these, re these results are a collection, are a list. You can understand how many elements we have, you matched, and uh, pick them one by one. The zero, one, two, three, it's just an array, a list of elements that happen to match the selector. Uh, or you can, so you can extract every element and work element by element, or you can call methods directly on the collection. But remember that the result of jQuery is an element, but most, mostly is a list of elements. Could be an element, but usually is a list of elements. So you can call some method, and there's a lot of methods in jQuery that operates dire directly on the collection. And actually, internally, they replicate the operation onto some internal element. Um, and so, what can you do? You can, for example, change some attributes. Span ID message dot text with a, a given text. So you are changing the text attribute of the elements or elements that match the left selector, the jQuery selector. So we are selecting some elements and then changing the text inside of if we only have plain text content. Or if we have uh, an HTML content, we just have change dot HTML and it will create all the DOM nodes, uh, will parse the HTML for us, and so on. So in this case, uh, it looks like it's working only on one element, because the selectors have an hash <laughs> sign, so they match a specific ID. But if, if it were a list, then all the elements of the list will get the text change. Hmm? Um, we can change an attribute. For example, this, this first line takes all the links in the page with a class nav, the links, the A, the anchor elements, and will change the value of the href attribute to this website. So it will uh, hijack, redirect all the links uh, to that website. It's not particularly useful, but uh, can be done. If there is only one link that matches this, then only that one is modified. If there are 200 links that match this uh, uh, selector, all of them will have their attribute modified. And this is if I want to modify only one attribute. If I want to modify more than one, I can write them into a dictionary. So in JavaScript, it's a this, this syntax is the syntax for creating an object, like in Python. Value property, value property, value property, and exactly JSON. Hmm. JSON syntax was copied from JavaScript, so actually we are familiar with that. Hmm. So we can uh, modify the attributes. We can, very useful, adding or removing classes. So just imagine having the CSS ready for a normal element and from, uh, for an highlighted element and for a deleted element, depending on the class. So the JavaScript will only need to add or remove one class to change the appearance of the element. We don't want to modify, usually, to modify the attributes of the one by one to change the color, to change the background, and so on, inside the JavaScript code. We just change the class name, and in the CSS, we'll define, of course, all the, all the details about what is the effect of applying that class. 
And this changes, so adding or removing classes to all the matching elements. Or, low level, we can inject some CSS style directly. I would not recommend that. And the nice part of uh, jQuery is that we don't need to learn a lot of uh, function names because in most of the cases, the same function name is used both for getting and setting the value. For example, attr, the attribute method, we saw that it was usually a two parameters, the attribute name and the new value to be set. If we only provide one value, instead of a setting the attribute, it becomes a reading the attribute. So if, the, if we only specify the attribute name, then this one would be a get operation for the attribute value. And so we can use this value here. HTML was used for modifying the content of an element by providing the new content. If I call it without any parameter, it will give me the content of the element. Huh? So usually, if you have one argument more, this argument is the value to be set. If you have one argument less, that function will give you the current value of that specific part of the element or attribute value and so on. For example, val and not value, I hate them for this choice, but they call it val instead of using value, which is the name of the attribute, is the current value of an input element. Val, like this, will retrieve the value. Inside val, if I put a string, it will set the value to this string. So we only need to learn half of the names because uh, the same name is used for reading and writing the attribute. And also we have uh, methods for navigating the DOM, like we did in the first examples. We go to the parent element, we go to the rightmost child or brother with next uh, or, or, or the previous one. Imagine you have a list item, you, you need to navigate through all the, from the first to the second to the third item in the list. So they are all one after the other and so on. And the nice part of this that is that they work also on collections. So if this jQuery selector, this first part, uh, finds five divs, five elements, because there are five divs with class equal to section, if you call parent, it will return you five elements, which are the five parents of each of the five divs. So the method applies to a collection and returns a collection. Hmm? And, uh, and so it can, you can do pretty sophisticated things. Uh, finding elements, reading values, and setting values. And Java, uh, jQuery also makes it very easy to modify or to define event handlers. You told me, but we already know how to define event handlers. Yes, we do. We already know because we know that in the HTML, we can write on click here and uh, on focus there and so on. But in this way, we are in some way creating a dependency between the HTML code and the JavaScript code. And if we, if we want to, so the, the HTML code needs to know the names of the JavaScript functions. If I change the name of the JavaScript functions, I need to revise all the HTML pages. If I restructure the HTML pages, then I need to be sure that we are, I make uh, the right event handler. If I want to add a new event handler to all the buttons, or I need to go by page by page, uh, input by input element, adding the, 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 the right attribute. It would be much easier if we could register these event handlers directly from JavaScript, from the JavaScript code, like this. Selecting a bunch of elements 
more than one because the selector can select many dot click is the method for the event handler of the click event so we are registering in javascript a new event handler for the click event for all the elements that are matching this jQuery expression. All the elements. So in one line, we are registering maybe 20 different event handlers. And we are specifying which function needs to be called when the event occurs. Okay? And we, pro we are providing the function there as a parameter of the click event. This is a strange thing that we we'll get used to doing in JavaScript. Functions are variables like any other type of variable. So you can use a function as a parameter to another function. So we are inside here the open and close parentheses of the click function. And inside that, we have the full definition of a function, including the body and the, the, the curly braces that delimit the body. And so we can do, then, in this function, whatever the event handler needs to do. In this case, uh, everything is contained into the JavaScript code. So we have a clean HTML page with no JavaScript reference, and all the JavaScript code will register its own event handlers. If we need to modify which event handlers to register, which events to handle, we do everything from the JavaScript side. We don't need to touch the HTML. At the beginning of the page, we will just have to register all the event handlers. Another detail, is uh, you see this syntax uh, dollar this this is another way of uh, um, of using the jquery function we already learned that this is a reference to the current uh, dom object that represents uh, the element uh, that generates the event it's, we are inside an event handler so this is the the element where the event was generated that was a normal DOM object, a normal JavaScript object. If I take a JavaScript object and I pass this object to the jQuery function, uh, the jQuery function will give superpowers to this object. So it will become a jQuery object referring to the same element. So we can call all the jQuery methods on an element that was born as a normal JavaScript object. So whenever you have a reference, for example, a document uh, uh, s um, find by element ID, and we return a, a normal object, you want to call some JavaScript function from the object. First, you, you transform this object into a JavaScript corresponding one, uh, sorry, a jQuery corresponding one. And then you can call all the jQuery methods on that object. You cannot call a jQuery method directly on the JavaScript object. You need first to have a jQuery object. So it's a sort of a, I call it giving superpowers uh, or uh, yeah, giving more power to this object, to this uh, previous reference. We don't use it very much, but if we need to trigger an event in jQuery, we just use the same syntax as defining a new event handler. In this case, we are simulating the click because we are calling the event function click uh, without a parameter. So we are not uh, accepting a new handler, but we are using the previous handler. So if we want to emulate the behavior of a click, uh, we can just call that. And finally, the first line that we need to write is uh, when does all this happen? So we wanted to use uh, all the JavaScript functions and don't register HTML, um, don't register event handlers in the HTML code. 
So we will register event tenders di directly in JavaScript, or better, in jQuery. Where do we put this code? <coughs> we can put this code in th th these lines here. Forget about the last line. Into the JavaScript file that we are including in the page. So when the JavaScript file is being read, this code is executed immediately. Once, at the beginning of the page, just when the page is loaded. There is one problem, though. Uh, when we are including the script, the browser probably haven't read all the page yet because we are reading, it's reading the script tag, it doesn't, it doesn't even, it hasn't even reached the end of the page. So not all the DOM elements are ready, have been created. When we execute that script, the DOM is still incomplete. Depending on where we put the script into the page and how fast is the browser in processing and creating the DOM object. So the risk is that this query here doesn't return all the elements that we know, that we want, because not all of them are ready yet. So it's better to delay these operations of registering events, or in general modifying or doing something with the HTML, until we are sure that the DOM is ready that all the nodes for all the page have been created. Guess what? The browser generates an event just for that. And this event is called the document ready event. So we want to include all of our code inside the, heaven, the event handler for the document ready event. So imagine what happens. The page is read and includes the JavaScript. The JavaScript contains this line. This line says, I want to register an event handler for the ready event on the document object. It's like putting the event uh, on the body of the page. So it's writing body on ready equal to when the ready event is generated by the document, by the body or by the root of the page. And all of this code is just, is not executed now. It's just set aside because it's the definition of the event tender that will be called later when the document object will generate the ready event. So we are executing just one line, setting aside, registering an event tender and setting aside a function that will be executed later. Then the browser will go on and read the page and construct all the nodes. When all the, it's complete, when the browser completes its work, it will fire the read event on the document object. The DOM will say, okay, I'm ready. And this function now gets called. This function will register all the event handlers for all the elements of the pages, of the page that we need to register events for later on. And this event tender will register functions that will be called even later on when the user will click eventually, possibly, on those events. Hmm? It's always planning for the future. And you're registering something for a future event, and when this happens, I'm registering something else for a future event, and when that happens, I'm doing something. I know. We have to live with that. Um, okay, so let's uh, try to see it, to match this concept in, onto the, our example. We try to reproduce this behavior in jQuery, right? So the first step would be getting rid of all the old style event handlers. Go away. And then making sure that we can 
easily identify the elements that we want to work with. Hmm? So add, having uh, IDs or classes for the elements that are important for us. The submit button already has an ID, has an ID. the input uh, already has an ID, input description. And these list uh, items, uh, list group item, uh, it's a general, a generic class. So I probably better add an, another class, uh, like a task list, uh, task item. And this uh, UL would have an ID of task list. I'm marking HTML so that if I need to refer to it later from the JavaScript, I already have all the class and ID um, anchors for creating the CSS descriptors. Just a detail, but uh, why did I create an ID for the UL element and a class for the list elements instead of an ID also for list? Couldn't I create an ID here also? ID equal to task item? Say no. Why not? Because I'm in a form. So this line is copied many times over. And so that would, if I had to define an ID here, I would define many elements with the same ID, which is illegal. It can do that. So if I have a group of elements that have a joint behavior, I must find uh, 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 they have a common class. They cannot have a common ID. Hmm? OK. And the same, uh, this glyph icon, uh, I could have a class like uh, um, uh, icon copy, copy icon. Better. Task copy icon. We, we are not paying for the character, so we can be a little more verbal. So right now we don't have any, we just it's just pure, this is just pure HTML. And CSS and classes and bootstrap code, of course. Now we move to the JavaScript code. Forget about this for a moment, and we start over with the, J uh, with the jQuery mindset. So everything should happen only after the document is created. So the first and only statement at the top level would be this document dot ready call where the argument of this call is the function is the event handler so a function that will be executed when the document actually actually is ready so a function like this function Parentheses for the function arguments, we don't need any. Braces for the function body. And so we enter into these braces, and here we write the code that will be executed when the document becomes ready. Right? So the JavaScript in line one is executed while the page is loading. The JavaScript in page two is executed, in, on line two, sorry, is executed when the page has finished to load and uh, the DOM objects are all defined. Already all the attribute values are, are been defined, have been defined. So, we, so it's sometimes later. At this point, uh, we need to register the event handlers for the focus 
we are implementing the same functionality as before, right? Just with the new jQuery philosophy. So let's find the focus. Is the element with ID, uh, how, is called, how do they call it? it? Input description. Right? Is, is the, yes, it's the right one. Thanks to PyCharm that is able to find, <laughs> to autocomplete the name, the, the IDs. So, jQuery dollar input, hash input description is the jQuery object referring to the input element. And on this input element, we should register the focus event. Focus in. jQuery is called focus in when the element gets the focus, as opposed to when the element uh, loses the focus. But no, or the focus. No, no, focus, sorry. It's focus. Focus in is a different thing. Focus and blur are the two different events. And so we are registering a new JavaScript, a new handler for this event. How? How, are, how, are do, how can we do that? By providing a function that will be called when the event is fired. And what does this function do? It will remove the disabled attribute from the submit button, right? Dollar hash submit button finding the element and then operating on it. Uh, disabled Is there an enable method? Probably yes. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the documentation before writing random. So that we see where the documentation is. In, on jQuery.com, API documentation. gives you all the, for example, methods for handling the attribute, for um, the, for the, the, main, the main function, the CSS functions, how to modify, and all the, for example, for forms, uh, focus, Binding an event handler to the focus event, okay, that's right. Um, then we have, uh, what, do, what are we using? Okay, should be okay. Hmm? Okay, and uh, if you want to learn about finding elements, you go to the selector page where you have all the ways in which you can find elements. So the finding element is the ID selector, the class selector, everything we know, plus a lot of uh, other details. Okay, uh, so that should be probably okay. If I try to run this, run this again, Load the page, remember to shift reload it so that it uh, will reload the JavaScript. Now the button is not, and now and, and it still isn't. Okay. Is it working? First of all, okay, let me comment this to avoid any conflict. Let's try to understand why it's not working. Is 
explode. Not very, they click here, still not very. So something is not working. Let's find out what. So for debugging the JavaScript, you need to go into the, to be into the browser. Okay. Enable is not a function. Okay, that is the error. So PyCharm will not be able to mark you many errors because it doesn't know, JavaScript is a very dynamic language. It doesn't know all the properties or it doesn't even know all the libraries that we have loaded, to, uh, that we already loaded. And only the browser, when running the code, will mark you some error. And only if you seek for it. There's no pop-up that's saying, okay, you have a JavaScript syntax error or something is wrong. It just doesn't work. So you need to go into the developer tools and change it to the, uh, let me guess, jQuery, disabled. Uh, the property would be like this prop or is there any another example would be attribute disabled or remove attribute disabled you can do that also so there is no enable or disable method. We should work on the attribute. And now it should work. I'm not afraid and not ashamed of being wrong. It happens every time. Okay, now it's working. So, debugging JavaScript is very difficult. Uh, because by default, it doesn't generate any error, it doesn't generate any warning, it doesn't crash. And the PyCharm can only detect so much because uh, it can only detect the, the syntax errors, but not the semantic errors, because it doesn't know which methods are defined for which object. So most of the debugging will be on the browser, on the developer tools of the browser. So if you open them, uh, you need to go, oh, so this is again uh, Internet Explorer, which has, they, the, all the three or the, the four major browsers have this sort of debugging features, uh, but you need to, to activate them and, and to seek them, seek the, the errors, okay? In, in Chrome, we are a bit more familiar we have these sources where you can browse the, so the code, the JavaScript source, and also the console where the errors are printed. The console is a log window in which all the compi JavaScript compiler errors are printed. You need to go there, otherwise the browser doesn't, doesn't tell you. So if we reload here in Chrome, we should see that this, right now we don't have any parsing errors, and this is also working here. And no errors are, are being logged, logged to the console. Okay. Um, we still go on for, for five minutes, then we, we have a break. Um, for implementing the second functionality. So the, second, the second functionality was uh, uh, adding a behavior to the, down, to the copy down icon. So again, we are registering, so we are in the handler of the document ready function. We, are, we want to register an event for all the icons where, what is the class that we defined? Task copy icon. Class, task, copy icon and we want to redefine the click event 
on that on those elements with a function in one statement we are defining many event handler one for each uh, download button Well, define the same function and associated it, associated that function to all of them. Because in this case, class task copy icon contains many elements. So in that case, again, we are extracting the text. How? By starting from the element, and then we are going. Uh, We want to find uh, the list item that contains this element. Okay? So how can you work with selectors? Hierarchy. What do they say? Child selector, descendant selector, next sibling, next adjacent. It's not what we want, probably because it only goes down, we need to go up. So, where is that? Selectors, traversing. So we cannot select them, but we can traverse, navigate the DOM. Like we have uh, get, uh, I like this one. Parent, get the parent of each element in the current set of matched elements, option and filter by selector. Or parent, get the ancestors of each element in the current set, option and filter by selector. What does it mean? Parent is the node immediately above you. Ancestors are the parents of the parents of the parents of the parents all of the nodes that contain you. So if we don't know, or we, if we pretend not to know, or we don't want to know our, the, the detailed structure of our list items, so not knowing whether we should go up one or twice, or the parent relationship, we can use uh, this, oh sorry, and parents. Uh, method allows to search through the ancestors of this element in the DOM tree and construct a new query order from the matching elements, uh, maybe more than one, order from the immediate parent up. So the first one I defined would be the closest one from the closest to the outer ones. This is what I want. And I can, we say, filter with the uh, with a selector. So where is that? Uh, if the selector is applied, the element will filter by testing whether they match it. So we only want to match a list item with a given class. So for all, of all these ancestors, I only need that one. So I'm trying to rephrase the finding phase. I want to find an element by explaining what I want to find and not blindly just uh, going three steps and hoping that it's right. Okay. So parents and the selector that we want is a list item with a class, uh, class uh, task item. And for this, I want to extract the text. And once I have the text, I just want to fill the value of the input uh, description with that text.
it's a strange way of programming, okay? I understand, it's very strange at the beginning. Let's try it. If it doesn't work, I will use the break for debugging. Of course it doesn't. Did I load this properly? Oh no, it does, does. So I, di I didn't reload the, with the shift. Uh, okay, so it's working. Actually, if you want to be sure of how it works, uh, you can set a breakpoint here. Just click on the line, this is Chrome. And when you click here, the debugger stops, and we show you that you are here, that this variable points to this span element that is also highlighted in the, in the page above. We, you can see all the variables, and if you go one step, you have uh, the, var the text variable that contains this content here. And the next step would be changing the value of the text of the input description. Right now we have everything on one line, so it's difficult to debug. Now if you want to debug, it's better to split in different lines uh, to do the computation in different steps. But when you're trying to sort out what is not working, just set up a, a, um, a breakpoint inside an event handler and then go line by line. You see all the variables here and all the objects there. Okay. So this is a new tool, a new powerful tool to give a dynamic behavior to a web page after it's loaded. There's only one limitation here. The limitation is that we are limited inside the web page. We can do whatever we want with the DOM of the page. We can add information, remove, find, modify, whatever you want, write a video game. You have full control of the DOM and of the user actions of every event, but it's everything in this page. So whenever we want to do something that needs to involve the server, we can do that because we are close into the page. When we want to delete an item, when we want to add an item, we still need to rely on the browser to send the post or send the get and then re reload the page from the beginning, creating a new page from, from scratch, a new HTML page, a new JavaScript, and so on. So what we are trying to do in the next hour will be to remove this final limitation. So what if we could also, from our HTML, call some function that depend on the server? Like, I don't know, auto-completion. If you are trying to write a word here, the server could give you a list of the possible words to complete by querying the database. We cannot do here, here, it's here because maybe we don't have the full list of to-dos also with the old ones, also for the other, for, from the other people or whatever. So when we do something that will involve the, 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 the server, we need to learn how to extend what we know. Ideally, we already have a REST server implementing all the functionality for the to-do list. So could we call the REST method from here? And have one page that in JavaScript will call the REST method for adding one element, for removing one element, for modifying it, and so on. So that will be the next step. The modern way of developing application is having a one big page with a lot of JavaScript code that is all independent, running on the browser. And whenever you need to do something or to query new or to get new information, that page will call the REST function on the server and then we'll update the, uh, the user interface. So after a 15 minutes break, we'll try to 
break this last wall so we start again at uh, 610 